Welcome to Versus History with Elliot Watson and Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Good afternoon and welcome to Versus History. My name is Dr. Elliot L. Watson and with me is Patrick O'Shaughnessy. How are you, Patrick? Elliot, it's good to see you, sir. Welcome. Thanks for debating with me once again. Yes, last week, yes, here we are. One <laughs> last week, it was Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King. This week, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be Malcolm X. But before we get there, can I just give you an update, Elliot, on how please well do, Patrick, please. how well we're doing in terms of our Twitter following? We're now up to 348 followers Woo-hoo! at present. Thank you to everyone that continues to subscribe and download the podcast. But just going to shout out. You're going to have to humour me here, Elliot. Okay, all going right. to shout out a few of our new followers. I can't do all because there's over 100 new ones since last week. So at random and in no particular order. Mr. McNally, Judy Milne, Miss KP, Alpha History, Andrew Ray, Caroline Malsha, School Wellbeing Network, Mr. Murray, Elizabeth Peacock, Kevin Zayner, Sally Luane and the Wolsey Academy and Woolerton Bluecoat Academy in Nottingham. Thank you very, very, very much for subscribing to us and also thank you to everyone that got back to us. Um, I know you asked this week as well. Yes, I did. Uh, for some assistance. And I figured it was a bit I... unfair if you keep asking for help and I don't, uh, so I thought I'd ask for help as well. And uh, I received a couple of tweets back, very charitable tweets back from uh, particularly a chap called David Van Tol, who, uh, and I'm going to use his ideas a little bit later on. Indeed, and I got some feedback too uh, from many, many people. History Hod was one of them. There are so many others. But thank you very much indeed because um, Versus History is all about being inclusive. It's all about getting involved. And thanks to everyone that gave us some underpinnings to our forthcoming debate on Malcolm X. And to conclude, if you'd like to be on a podcast or contribute a chapter to the book that's going to be coming out, fingers crossed, at the latter end of this year, Get in touch via www.versushistory.com. There's a submission pro forma there. Get your ideas in and hopefully we can get you in the book or on a future podcast. Fantastic. Enough of that. More of you, sir. So last week we spoke about uh, Martin Luther King. And I think we naturally come to his, what some people might call his antithesis, Malcolm X. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a precy, an overview of Malcolm X so that we can then get into our discussion. So let's go, Elliot. Brilliant. Malcolm X, born May 1920 as Malcolm Little. His father, a Baptist minister who spoke out against inequality, was murdered in 1931. And I think as a man and as a character, particularly in his early years, this had a very significant impact on him. He ends up involved in a number of crimes and sent to prison. After his release in 1952, he joins Elijah Muhammad's Nation of Islam. He then contributes to the spread of Nation of Islam um, across uh, the United States. His ideology, for want of a better word, Word, uh, the promotion of his thoughts was uh, essentially critical of white community and their contributions or lack thereof to the American black society in American life. He spent a lot of time on the public circuit, on television shows, uh, promoting different view of the how black Americans should fight for their civil rights or their equality and it was this that was controversial this is something we're going to talk about in a little bit throughout the course of his life he did promote the nation of Islam but he ultimately fell out with Elijah Muhammad the leader of the nation of Islam and it was really this falling out that ultimately led to his assassination February 1st 1965 at the Audubon Ballroom now I'm going to leave it there that's my little bit of a praise I'm going to hand it back to you to give us something a little bit more personal I think Great praise. It's very difficult job to do, Elliot, because he's such a interesting and varied character. I think it's also worth throwing in that his father, who was a Baptist minister, was a Garveyite, so he was very interested uh, in the sort of back, to, back to Africa movement. And whilst Malcolm wasn't particularly gone on religion in his early days, this must have had some sort of influence. There's lots more to Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam. Now, the first thing I want to say is, having grown up in South East, South West London as a young man, first time the Nation of Islam came to sort of into my ether or to my attention was during the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. Ah, um, yes. Members of the United Kingdom based Nation of Islam, which is actually a different a sort of reincarnation of the nation from the nation that we're talking about <laughs> okay. under Malcolm. Right. Yeah. But they were they came to prominence then. 
Louis Farrakhan, the current leader of the Nation of Islam, wanted to visit the UK, but is currently barred from doing so by the Secretary of State for England, for better or for worse. You can make that decision. There's also a Malcolm X Boulevard, I noticed, on my drive into New York. I was coming down from Boston, down uh -huh. the eastern seaboard, and as you go through Harlem, one of the major tributaries there is called Malcolm X Boulevard. Ah, so this gentleman must have had some impact, a huge impact. Well, actually. my argument is he had a very significant impact. Yeah. Also, if you are a film buff, you may well have seen the Spike Lee epic from the early 1990s starring none other than Denzel Washington on the man himself, Malcolm X. And who hasn't read Alex Haley's autobiography or biography, whatever you want to call it. He worked with Malcolm X in the last years of his life to compile this book and uh, what a popular one it is published in many, many languages, and it attracts all sorts of readers. You know, it's a very, very popular book. So Malcolm X, everyone's heard of him, and hopefully if you don't know much about him, this podcast will help you. It's not going to be all analysis. We're going to try and tell some story with it too. Yeah, yeah. Okay then, Elliot, I suppose I'm going to be critiquing That's right. his, Im his, imp his impact and his significance. You're going to be supporting that he had a big impact. A significant impact, that's <laughs> yeah. right. That's Do you want right. to start off then, uh, sir? Yeah, why not? Why not? Okay, now I think it's probably a good idea to take up from where we left off last week. My argument last week about Martin Luther King was essentially that he had his ideology, his methods, and his plans were inherently limited. They were inherent, her, inherently limited because they they seemed to only wish to address particularly southern problems. So the problems of segregation, but then also the slightly wider problem of voter registration and voting rights. Once he turned his sights on the north to the more socioeconomic plight of the, uh, the black community, that's where he let himself down. And I think that's where we need to start speaking speaking about Malcolm X. What Malcolm X did was he provided an alternative, an alternative source of devotion, an inter alternative source of solutions to the problems that were peculiar most specifically to young, urban, not necessarily Christian, not necessarily particularly religious to start with, young, uh, urban, poorly educated blacks in the North. And it was the problems of social, that the social and economic problems that Martin Luther King and his peaceful protests were unable to solve. That was where Martin Luther King was able to insert his belief in the promotion of black community, regardless of whether the white community was there to try and help. And I think he inserted himself uh, and his ideology perfectly into the minds uh, and the emotions and the thoughts of the young northern black community. He began to really for the first time since Marcus Garvey in the 20s, he began to uh, to promote this notion that not only should the black community be proud of themselves, that that but that they shouldn't be looking for help from the white community in the way, the same way that perhaps Martin Luther King was. In fact, Martin Luther King was often decried by Malcolm X as an Uncle Tom, a man who was really working for the white man rather than the black community. And for, to my mind, the first place I'd like to go is this, is that Malcolm X provided an alternative, an immediate alternative to the slow, creeping process of civil rights that Martin Luther King was uh, so uh, enamored with. So if I leave it there for the moment, where do you? Where would you like to go from there? I'm going to come in with a little bit of story before I sort of lay some analysis on if that's right, all right. Go on then. About the nation of Islam. Ah, yes, okay. In Detroit, a gentleman called Fard Muhammad. Now nobody knows where he came from. Nobody really knows what he did while he was alive in Detroit with Elijah Muhammad. No one knows where he went to. It's a genuine historical mystery. He essentially preached that. Black people were a member of the tribe of Shabazz, mm -hmm. God's chosen people, and that white people were creations and made not by God, but by a man called Yacoub some thousands of years ago. So essentially he preached a doctrine of black separation and integral differences between the races and a creed of do for self. Black people, as you've rightly said, Elliot, need to stop looking to white people for help. In fact, they need to do the opposite. They need to 
do for self and separate away. The nation of Islam essentially wanted to create a nation of Islam, a separate country, state, call it what you will, in the United States of America, only for black people along the religious dictums of Fahd Muhammad and then subsequently Elijah Muhammad who leads the movement from 1933 to 1975. So essentially this is not a civil rights organization. Now the reason I bring it up is because for the majority of Malcolm X's public life, so after he leaves prison, up to a year before he was assassinated, Malcolm X is the parrot of this organization. I think, I know you wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but he's, no. I think, something we can agree on. He was probably more widely known than its leader, Elijah Muhammad. He was Almost a better certainly. speaker. Most certainly. Um, he was the most outspoken proponent of its philosophy. And the reason we're talking about this is Malcolm X was a member of this organization for most of the time that we are aware of his life. He only, he's only out of it for one year. So for the majority of the speeches we've heard of him, the things we've heard him say, all the white devil quotes, they are probably when he's in the Nation of Islam. Most so likely. they're inseparable. Okay, that's the Nation of Islam description done, and, and, and I'm sorry if I've done them or him or Elijah Muhammad a disservice, but that's how I understand it. Okay, moving on to Malcolm X, I think it's important then for me to say he was not a civil rights Leader, mm -hmm. civil rights and separation are different. Civil rights, if you go along the sort of creed of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, they want to live with whites in harmony, but with equality. The Nation of Islam and Malcolm X for most of his life did not want that. They wanted complete separation from the white race. For them, the white race was unsalvageable. There was no good in them, so there was very little point trying to integrate with them. Uh -huh. White people were inherently evil. There was no good in them. Black people were essentially the new nation of Islam, the tribe of Shabazz. They were, they were closer to God. And essentially, Malcolm X advocated a dictum or philosophy of complete separation of the races. So. Malcolm X was not a civil rights leader. Now it's also difficult to measure his impact. Right. Really. Before you get into that, can I just? You know, can I just? Uh, I will concede that when he was in the Nation of Islam, he, it's very difficult, perhaps, to consider him a civil rights leader, simply because he didn't look to gain a degree of equality through the law, through uh, the legislative process or the judicial project process. Um, but I would uh, say that I would challenge you that once he was separated from the Nation of Islam, he came, both he and Martin Luther King moved closer towards each other, ideologically speaking. And he moved away gently from this absolute belief that there should be two nations within the borders of the United States. And I think at that point, he does become uh, something of a civil rights leader. But my argument will later be that his importance perhaps lies outside of the orbit of civil rights and in another place. Right, I'm going to get back, hand it back to you now, Patrick. No worries, thank you very, very much for that. I'm going to come in with my first quote of the day, just to, uh, just to count it if, I'm, if I will before Everybody I... Everybody loves a bit of historiography. <laughs> yeah, before I, I, I get in with my tirade. Malcolm X, this is from Professor Ling at Nottingham University. Malcolm X was not a civil rights leader. He did not lead a single significant campaign for civil rights during the final phase of his career, so after the nation, however positive and protean his developing ideology may appear. So he was not a civil rights leader in my view, I, but I do concede to Elliot, uh, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King did move closer to each other it was mutual in the final years of his life I think one of the problems with Malcolm X is people see in him that which they want to see in him now you're gonna have to humor me here go on, go on. okay so if you are a an activist a social activist you may well see and compartmentalize Malcolm X's social activism if you are a civil rights activist or you believe in civil rights you may well see the sort of last year of Malcolm X's life in some sort of myopic isolation mm. he is essentially a Marmite figure <laughs> for me his message and his philosophy was self-defeating Ooh, but I'll go into why and where and how. You can't let that hang, on. surely. I'll carry on then. Fantastic. <laughs> it's um, self-defeating. Come on, please tell me. Okay. In terms of Malcolm X, he never courted, he never wanted the support of white people, unlike Martin Luther King. White people, however sympathetic they were to his cause, could never assist. Malcolm's messages were unpalatable to the masses, black and white, and incongruent with the will of the mass of black people across the United States, North and South, which was to integrate and improve their lives within the American societal structure as was. 
Malcolm X advocated rejecting this. But Malcolm X critically misunderstood the majority of black Americans. He did not realize that most black people did not want to change their religion or join the Nation of Islam. He didn't understand that, he critically misunderstood it. But furthermore, not only did he demonize all white people on the basis of their race, although in the last year of his life he did temper that slightly, he also attacked Christianity relentlessly as being an Uncle Tom religion. So by doing that, he actually lost potential convert. Christianity in some way, shape or form, usually a Protestant format, uh, was the religion or creed of most of the black community. This using these labels like Uncle Tom against black people who were within the boundaries of the system really just won him short term victories. They might have sounded good, it was shock value, but he actually in the long term found himself short of followers. I'm going to hand back over to you. Right. I, I'm just going to, I'm going to take issue first of all with this idea that his ideas were unpalatable to the black community. I would say that if you were talking about educated, upwardly mobile, middle class blacks, then I would probably agree with you. If you're talking about the white community, for the most part, I would probably agree with you. However, it's important to remember that he wasn't preaching necessarily to those people, those followers of Martin Luther King. Why would he? He was preaching to the disenfranchised, socially and economically, and culturally, let not, let's not forget this, in the northern urban centers. Now, if you think that the majority of people, or if there was nobody within the black community that was interested interested in his in his ideas then i would give you these examples cities that lit up in riots in from 1965 to 1968 watts in los angeles chicago in 1965 san francisco and new york in 1966 newark and detroit in 1967 baltimore and washington dc in 1968 in these eight cities alone 100 people 118 people died these were national riots. These were exactly the people that he was trying to uh, attract as well as to educate, and they absolutely were not interested in peaceful protest. So that's point number one. This idea that he didn't really do anything, this idea that there was nothing uh, concrete about his impact, I, I would probably say that were there any laws passed I I as a result of his promotion of them? No. However, his impact is lasting, and I'm just going to give you some concrete examples before perhaps we we move on to 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 uh, his cultural impact, which is which is the area that I think is perhaps most exciting. You have to remember that he was one of the first black icons of uh, sorry icons of the black American community that used television effectively. And thank you for David Van Toll for reminding me of this. Martin Luther King was 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 a man who certainly went on his marches and his protests and what have you. But Martin uh, Malcolm X was a a multi media proponent of black power. He was, uh, he's recorded as he had speaking engagements at Harvard Law School, at Oxford, at Howard University, Columbia. We had debates, forums, radio stations, TV on Open Mind uh, and the Mike Wallace News Program. The New York Times in 1963 reports that Malcolm X was the second most sought after speaker in the US after Republican President candidate Barry Goldwater. He establishes uh, and promotes the Nation of Islam. As soon as he comes out, of the, uh, out he is uh, out of prison. He uh, he becomes the minister of the Nation of Islam's mosque, Temple Number 11. Then the next year, Temple 12 in Philadelphia. And then Temple 7 in New York. Within 12 years, the Nation of Islam had mosques all over the U.S. and sympathizes in every section of the black population. These are measurable and these are concrete. And they're as a result of his activities. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to start, if I may, by supporting some of your points about no, his no, no, intellectual no, no, no. contribution. And I'm going to come back to hopefully show why overall he had a very limited impact. Okay, his main impact was undoubtedly intellectual. By saying that, I'm implicitly saying there were very few tangible gains. He certainly You've inspired... You've just wiped out every university professor's career. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly inspired a a host of media, film, song, rap in the 1980s. Quote from Professor Ling, throughout his career, Malcolm was always more symbol and teacher than leader and strategist. Now I'm gonna come back to chronology if I may. It wasn't until December 1963 that Malcolm was suspended from the Nation of Islam. 
he made his chicken coming home to roost comment about the assassination of JFK. Yeah, yeah. He also organized a protest against the raid on a Los Angeles Nation of Islam temple, which Elijah Muhammad did not want. So for the majority of his life, Malcolm X was really just a, a mouthpiece for the, the mantras of Elijah Muhammad. If we listen to his speeches, Everything is prefixed and suffixed with the Honourable Elijah Muhammad teaches us so on and so forth. The Honourable Elijah Muhammad says this. I think we get the idea yeah. there. So essentially, Elijah Muhammad was his ventriloquist. Elijah Muhammad gave him the platform on which to speak. Elijah Muhammad filled his mouth with the mantras. Only the last year of his life, when Malcolm moves away from the nation, that Malcolm is able to speak his mind. And we actually get an idea of what Malcolm himself actually wants to say. Essentially, Malcolm X really for the majority of his life, apart from the final year, we see nothing but nation of Islam mantras spewing forth from his mouth. We see nothing but what Elijah Muhammad wants him to say. So really and truly to, to, to judge his success, if we're looking chronologically, or if we're looking in terms of significance against any model, Christine Council's five R's or Partington's criteria, if we're looking at the most significant events of Malcolm X's life, it's within the paradigm or within the aegis or structure of the nation of Islam. He did set up a lot of mosques and he was a fantastic speaker. I'm sure most people in America had, had heard of Malcolm X in the 50s and 60s. One in 10, probably Elijah Muhammad, hmm. anecdotal. But Malcolm X was a great speaker, but really he was just saying what Elijah Muhammad wanted him to say and would let him say and when he wanted him to say it and how he wanted him to say it. V very possible. Did you just call Malcolm X a ventriloquist? Or rather uh, a ventriloquist dummy? That's what you just a called him. A ventriloquist dummy. I think Elijah Muhammad was pulling his strings. Elijah, he, he, he only could say and only wanted to say, to be fair to Malcolm, okay. that which Elijah Muhammad had given him. In, in his early reformed life after he in prison and out of prison, yeah. he sees Elijah Muhammad as as his saviour, you know, and, and that's understandable. He's yeah, gone from being a criminal. Uh, 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 but, but within him. those parameters, yes. is he successful? Within the parameters of the Nation of Islam, is he successful? Ultimately, in, in, not. In, in no. the ideology that he's promoting, which is no. the promotion of the Nation of Islam and separatism. No, because it, it was ne the Nation of Islam could never deliver anything more than minority reports. The Nation of Islam was never popular with the rank and file or the rump of the black community. Might he have been more successful had he not been assassinated in 1965? Not within the Nation of Islam, because he was no longer within it. So then, with his renewed vigour and his new ideas... That's very, very, very difficult to say. It certainly is. What I will say is if we're looking at him within the, the framework of the nation of Islam, the only way we can really gauge his success is by the amount of temples, as they call them, or yeah. mosques in, in, in their latter days that, that were built. But that's not solely attributable to Malcolm. But what is, is he then later in 1964 founds Muslim Mosque Inc., certainly, but then he organises the secular organisation of Afro-American unity. And so... We do have a very clear indication of a, a politicizing of his ideas because remember in the Nation of Islam he was forbidden to make political statements. Indeed, yes, he was. He was. But that he changed that very swiftly once he separated from um, the Nation of Islam. Now, can we just rather than getting into that now, unless you have anything else to say uh, uh, about that particular subject? No, I think it's just 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 for our, our listeners' benefit, just so we know. Um, MMI, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, he set that up in March 1964 as his religious wing. Yes. And then OAAU in May 64 was his secular political wing. That was the Organisation of Afro-American Unity. Yes. Back over to you. Right. Well, because I, I know we've talked about this before, and and your argument is essentially that there was very tangible, very few tangible, solid and practical developments in terms of the African-American community in the United States as a result of, uh, of Malcolm X and I would you know I would probably have to concede that there were no laws passed as a result of uh, Malcolm X's contribution in terms of civil rights but I think what we need to do is we need to look more culturally at the impact of Malcolm X because really what he becomes is he becomes this alternative figure to be held up by particularly the young, disenfranchised, urban black men and women who had immediate socio-economic 
problems. They liked the vigor of the man. They liked the aggression of the man. They liked the style of the man. Yep. And they certainly liked his oratory. They liked what he had to say to the point where I think we could both agree that his impact culturally can it resonates throughout uh, up until even today. We had an explosion, particularly in, in the 70s, of black exploitation films where you had men and women seeing themselves uh, as the central um, protagonist in films where they were tough and they were beautiful and they were sexy. We have an explosion of artwork. He encourages the black arts movement, which is a black, which is a, a branch of the black power movement, which Time magazine called the single most controversial moment in the history of African American literature, possible, um, possibly American literature as a whole. We see that uh, that cultural impact resonate through the 90s. You mentioned rap music, the yep. 80s. We've got Public Enemy. You have KRS One. If is anyone, I was a big fan of rap when I was younger. KRS One, one of the albums yes, of by course. any means necessary. KRS NWA. One. Yeah. Public well, Enemy, well not, nec not so much NWA because they were more um, they were less, less ideological and more far <laughs> less <laughs> conscious based. Certainly. Yeah. But KRS One most certainly he had that album cover where he mimics uh, uh, Malcolm X's uh, posture at or posing at the window with the AK-47 by any means necessary. And I think I think it's impossible, as you said, to quantify the impact of this man because when you're talking about cultural impact, it's almost by definition a self-defeating effort in order to do that. But I think it's undeniable, his cultural significance. Over to you. Yeah, I'm just going to throw in a few more rap bands just to, just to labour your point. Bands that have mentioned in rap songs or songs of other genres Black Muslim Philosophies, Farrakhan or Malcolm X. I've got Public Enemy and yep, Don't Public Believe Enemy. the Hype. Yep. I also have Buster Rhymes. He's a, f a member of the 5% Nation of Islam. Which is that a, right? Yes, I did it, not is know a, that. which is an outgrowth. The Fugees. Yeah, we have it, you know. So, so in oh, terms many, of many more, particularly in the late eighties. Uh, even Professor Griff, when he's when he separated very controversially from uh, from Public Enemy, he very much adopted the Nation of Islam and uh, Farrakhan's uh, ideas. But they are in. They are in. I think his impact is it transcends legislation. And you might think that's a bit of a cop out, but I think his impact is immeasurable in terms of the uplifting um, and the taking back control of the culture of and by the black community. Yeah, no, another little quote from Professor Ling here. The impact con of Malcolm X continues through the myriad invocation of Malcolm X in movies, music, and art. So repeat. It says, the media made Malcolm. I do agree, Malcolm X has had a massive impact in sort of modern day culture. Okay, gonna get back to after Malcolm leaves the nation now. I think it's important to note that the riots in the northern cities coincided with black power, but were not caused by any black power group or any black power individual. If we take the Black Panthers who did not cause the riots. No, nope, absolutely not. I know you haven't which, said that, yeah. just making just making the point. They had a very, very similar philosophy at the core to the Nation of Islam, which essentially black people need to do for self and provide for self, with mm -hmm. self. They didn't have any sort of religious elements, but they did have arms, which the, so firearms, which the Nation of Islam didn't. So it's actually, you know, in terms of looking at inspiration for, for groups who existed at the time, you could argue that the, the Black Panthers drew more of their ideology, their secular ideology, from the religiously inspired nation of Islam than they did from Malcolm X. It's a, but it's would a, they have known about it if Malcolm X had not been? Probably the, not, because he was their he was their most outspoken spokesperson, so, so to speak. It is paradoxical to note that Malcolm X refused to have guns and stated the nation. And on the day he was assassinated, he refused to allow his bodyguards to search for for guns at the Audubon Ballroom. True, and it was actually a gun of three Nation of Islam members. It said that killed him. Anyway, coming back to my main point, he does set up two organizations. He does split the spiritual and the secular, the secular being the organization of African American unity and the spiritual Muslim Mosque Incorporated. I've got a couple of things to say about these. Both of these groups folded quite quickly after he died. Yes. In the final year of his life, Malcolm X spends a enormous amount of time abroad, touring Arabia, Africa, UK even, and it is to the detriment of these groups. Both of these groups did not survive long. There was conflict between them. Malcolm was not there to guide, nurture and sustain these groups in their early days. Before you say that, doesn't, yeah, that, doesn't that prove his importance to these groups if when he was away and ultimately when he died they, they, they collapsed? 
that is definitely one way of looking at it. That's I think my it, way. <laughs> I think it shows that Malcolm had de- tried to separate the secular from the spiritual. That had been one of the bones of contentions of the Nation of Islam. Yeah. Malcolm X either couldn't do it within their remit or refused to do it or both. However, I'm going to give you some quotes here. The two, so MMIA and Organization of African American Unity, were in many ways incompatible with each other since the MMIA was mostly staffed by people who had left the Harlem Nation of Islam temple with Malcolm. The Organization of Afro-American Unity, however, attracted far more secular and better educated men and women. Both organizations struggled to develop because so much of their energies had to be expended on just protecting Malcolm from the mortal threat posed by vengeful members of the Nation of Islam and because Malcolm, partly to escape his enemies, spent so much of his last year of life traveling overseas. That's a heck of a quote. Yeah, it certainly is. Sorry about that. I I think it's it's worth saying neither of these organizations lasted more than two to three years after Malcolm died. They had very little political or secular traction. In fact, if we look at the Muslim Mosque Incorporated, this was essentially, because white people weren't allowed to join it, another black Muslim organisation minus Elijah Muhammad. Sure. So there's my indictment. Right. I'm just going to pick up on the last thing you said, and then I think I'm going to leave my arguments, okay? You mentioned how when he went abroad, things that he left behind began to fail. Now, what I would say is, is actually that's something that marks him out as very different to Martin Luther King. He actually gives the black community, particularly the northern black community, he gives them a world view. He yes. travels abroad, he's in the Middle East, he's in Africa, he visits Egypt in, in these places, visits Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Nigeria, Ghana. He even meets with Egyptian President Gab, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. So what he does is he actually broadens the belief or the worldview rather of the African American community and he puts them at the center of it. This is something that Martin Luther King can never be given credit for. In True. fact, I True. would be I would struggle to th- remember any time Martin Luther King went abroad during his time as a civil rights leader, but I may be incorrect there. And I'm going to throw some historiography back at Please you. Please do, we love it on versus history. Uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, writing at the, in the Atlantic, he says that uh, the, as a result of these travels, he effectively transformed himself into black America's ambassador to the developing world. For all of Malcolm's prodigious intellect, he was ultimately more an expression of black America's heart than of its brain. Malcolm was the voice of a black America whose parents had borne the slights of second-class citizenship, who had seen protesters beaten by cops and bitten by dogs, and children bombed in churches, and can only sit at home and stew. He preferred to illuminate the bitter calculus of oppression, one in which a people had been forced to hand over their right to self-defense, a right enshrined in Western law and morality and taken as an essential to American citizenship. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, the last year of his life, he definitely, I can't contend that. He, He did go abroad. He does broaden the paradigm for black Americans and he certainly makes people outside of the United States very much aware of what's happening within the United States in terms of the struggle. Maybe one of the reasons the CIA was so hot on his back wherever he went. Interestingly enough, Malcolm X completes his pilgrimage, which is a a religious duty required of all Muslims. He also changes his name to El Hajj Malik Mm El-Shabazz. When he goes abroad, I think we do see a shift in his core beliefs. I definitely think he was not as racist as when he began. Oh, undoubtedly. I think it's also worth mentioning, whilst he is on his travels abroad in the last year of his life, he he meets, by chance, Cassius Clay, who Ah, was known Muhammad Ali, and this is when the the rift is solidified between them. I think Muhammad Ali said it was one of the biggest regrets of his whole life, when he spoke to Malcolm and said, essentially, I don't want to ever speak to you again, because you have betrayed the messenger, Elijah Muhammad. Ah. So it's very, very sad. So he also spoke at the Oxford Union. Yes, he did. He made a very, very fiery speech there. It was Ballot or the Bullet, it was was known as. Uh Okay, I think the biggest role for Malcolm X is something that isn't written in many history books, but it was actually inspiring the son of Elijah Muhammad, known as Wallace Dean Muhammad, mm-hmm. who was later on be- we call Warith Dean Muhammad. Now, when Elijah Muhammad dies, it's Warith that takes over the Nation of Islam. Uh-huh. And within two to three years, the Nation of Islam is accepting white members. Yeah. Um, they have become a that. mainstream organization. And it's then that Abdul Halim Farrakhan, or Louis Farrakhan as we know him, uh-huh. re-establishes the Nation of Islam as is. So the Nation of Islam that exists today, based at Masjid Mariam in Chicago, United States of America, under the leadership of Louis Farrakhan is not the same nation of Islam because that nation of Islam essentially their mosques became regular orthodox mosques now Warith Dean Muhammad 
not only did he lead his journey to orthodoxy, but he was largely inspired by Malcolm. He gave the first invocation in the United States Senate ever by a Muslim in 1992. He met with the Pope in 1996, and when he died in 2008, he was a highly internationally regarded and respected, not only Muslim leader, but religious leader as well. So he was highly inspired by Malcolm and his journey to, or his embryonic journey to orthodoxy. So, so I might put that as a, something of a success then? Yeah, with, without a doubt. You know, I think what, what Malcolm showed is the nation had a sell-by date. Its philosophies were limited and you had to move beyond it if you wanted to engage with the struggle of empowering black people, which he definitely tried to do. And I'm going to finish with a quote for you, if go on, I may. Go on then. I think whilst many black people, as I said earlier, you know, didn't like his methodologies, didn't like the way he spoke, they never, ever, ever for a minute doubted his sincerity and the fact he was speaking what he believed this is true. for the benefit this of is black very people. True. So he said what he believed, even though many people didn't want to hear it. Okay, so this draws us to our natural conclusion, yes, I think. My view is that despite his unwillingness or his disinterest in creating laws through the legislative and judicial systems of, of what he perceived as white America, his role was perhaps most significant for the uh, development, the springing forth of a cultural promise for the black community. And it was that rising up of this communal spirit, this black pride pioneered by Marcus Garvey, that I think, which permeates through American culture, black culture, I think that is his lasting legacy. And yourself? Y yes, it is. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. And I wouldn't want to. Malcolm X, we have to consider he spent the majority of his public active life in the nation of Islam. It's just such a crying shame. In the one year he was out of the nation, he was out of the USA for a long, long time, even though I do concede he was internationalizing the struggle. It's just a shame we didn't see how we, he was going to progress. Was the MMI going to become more inclusive? Yes, um, yeah, that's very difficult. Was he going to reach out? Was he going to achieve some tangible gains? I think we said the same thing for JFK. We, it's difficult to criticize a man who's been assassinated. You know, when they're on a journey trying to achieve stuff, it's difficult to say they didn't do things and, and they're limited because they're assassinated. We An need unfinished to life. An yeah, unfinished without life. a doubt. Malcolm X, I love the film I, I just I loved the books I think he was a fantastic person and he was doing the right thing it's just a shame it was cut short and truncated so early by bullets in the order bumble room so very very difficult to decide okay so thank you very much to everybody listening this it has been versus history it certainly has it's been a pleasure once again uh, debating with you Patrick thank you Elliot and uh, do you want to tell them what we're doing next week or should uh, we keep that secret no we can tell them uh, next week we are going to be uh, debating the 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 the, 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 suffra the, 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 the. <laughs> the suffragettes and the yes. suffragists. Essentially, who did more? Exactly. He is the librarian six. I am history chappy. We are at Versus History. Tweet us, get involved, tell us what you reckon. Absolutely. Suffragists or suffragettes or are we, are we missing the point entirely? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for downloading and listening to this edition of Versus History. Subscribe. Visit us at our website www.versushistory.com